Welcome everybody on YouTube. I want to, wanted to give one example, a case study of topology applied to data. And this is an image patch example done by uh, Gunnar Carlson and others at, at Stanford University. Now over a decade ago, you know, probably closer to 15 years ago than a decade ago. So a brief refresher on persistent homology. If you have a set of, of data points, a set of point cloud data points, in persistent homology, you start adding in the short edges and then longer edges and then the longer edges. And same things with smaller triangles at first, but then larger triangles and larger triangles. And it's such a with tetrahedra. And you get sort of an increasing multi-resolution view of this data set. And in persistent homology, you track um, the number of one-dimensional holes and, and zero-dimensional holes that arise. So the way you read this barcode is um, at this first scale, we have a single connected component and no one-dimensional holes. Whereas at this scale, we again have a single connected component and two one-dimensional holes, and then et cetera. Now we have only one one-dimensional hole. And finally, no holes once it all fills in. Okay, so you might read this barcode as saying, well, this data set really has a single significant one-dimensional hole. Here it is. And it has another hole, but I'm gonna disregard that. That's probably sampling noise. All right, so the data set that we're gonna look at is three by three pixel patches from black and white photographs. So take your digital camera, go around and, and take a bunch of pictures, okay? And then from those pictures, crop out three by three pixel patches. So that might be some very small, tiny square that you cut out here, or some very small, tiny square that you cut out here, just three pixels by three pixels. Each patch has nine pixels. And so we can encode each patch as a point in nine dimensional space because it has nine different numbers encoding, you know, the level it is from, from white to gray to black. There are some normalizations going on in this, in this uh, case study that are important, but I won't belabor. Um, first of all, the authors throw out patches that are all of the same color. Okay, so if your patch is all gray, they throw it out. They're looking for patches that have some contrast in them that vary from white to gray to, to, to dark. Now the question is, what are the most common patches? Okay, so maybe, maybe these types of patches you see quite frequently, these gradients from, from black to white. Whereas maybe this checkerboard patch you see less frequently. Okay, so. What are the most common patches? What space do they form? What, what shape do they form? How, how do we describe the shape of the most common patches? All right. So first we're gonna take the very most common patches and I'm, I'm lying to you a little bit about what I mean by most common. Um, Sorry, I lost my speakers for a moment, but I assume you can hear me. Okay, so I'm gonna lie to you a little bit and by what I mean by most common patches, but, but let's just run with it and you can ask me more about it later. So when you look at the most common patches and take their persistent homology, these are the barcodes that you get. So sure, we have a lot of different connected components, but eventually the most common patches form one connecting component. And then as things merge up, we have a lot of noisy one-dimensional holes, but eventually there's a single one-dimensional hole. And two-dimensional holes, well, just noise. You know, the most common space that has a connect, single connected component and a single one-dimensional hole is the circle. And that is the right model for this data set of the most common three by three patches if you do um, a planar projection using PCA, this is the picture you get of the most common patches. 
And then if you select out those patches from various points along that circle, you get these linear gradients at all angles. You see that? So this circle of most common patches is linear gradients at all angles. And that's very nice and very beautiful and is sort of pleasing that we can describe the space of the most common patches by the circle of linear gradients. It tells us that nature prefers linearity. Linearity is the most common observed local phenomenon in these patches. All right, so the authors of this data set then included even more patches, expecting to still see the same circle. So now when they added in even more patches, however, the persistent homology had this very clear signal where you still have one connected component, one zero dimensional hole, but now you have five one dimensional holes, all right? So we have five long one dimensional bars corresponding to five one dimensional holes, which was very shocking to them. The model looks like this. If you project the next most common group of patches to the plane, you get what looks like a circle with a cross inside, okay? And you, and you may say like, wait, you told me there were five one-dimensional holes, but I clearly see four, okay? And that, that's, that's a good comment, but, but we'll get there. What this space is, is called the three-circle model. Perhaps I should write that down. Okay, and so it's three circles glued together. The first circle we've already seen, it's this red circle of linear gradients, okay? Glued to that is the circle in the um, circle of gradients. Um, I don't know whether to call this the vertical direction or the horizontal direction. Why don't I call this um, horizontal gradients because the color is changing you know, from left to right in these patches. I won't explain in full detail right now, but this forms a circle of patches that only vary in the horizontal direction. And in the vertical direction, they're constant, right? So along any column, these patches are, are constant, but along the rows, these patches change. And you also get a, um, you also get a circle of gradients now in the horizontal direction that include both quadru include both linear gradients in the horizontal direction, like these linear gradients, but they also include quadratic gradients here and here. All right, so this blue dotted, whoop, This blue dotted circle intersects the red circle at these two points. And this green dotted circle intersects this red circle at two points. So now I can show you where the five holes are coming from. Take the red circle and then take the um, green dotted circle and leave it as is, okay? But now take the blue circle and just draw it on the outside. So this portion of the blue circle, let's draw right here. We're topologists, we can move things around. And this portion of the blue circle, let's draw it down here. And now I can count for you the, the five holes. One, two, three, four, five, that were appearing um, in these one dimensional persistent homology barcode plots. All right, let me wrap up. So now let's look at even more patches. So add even more patches that are still common, but not quite as common. You get the following topological signature, which with Z mod 2Z coefficients could be either a torus or a Klein bottle. And amazingly, it turns out to be a Klein bottle as I'll explain. So, I started with this 
red circle of linear gradients in all, um, in all directions. And on the left-hand side, I'm gonna draw that circle in a very weird way. I'm gonna draw it as two pieces of string where I tie this patch to that patch, you see that they're the same. And I tie this patch to that patch, you see that they're the same to form a circle. Okay. The next most common patches I said were this three circle model where the green circle intersected the red circle in two points and the blue circle intersected the red circle in two points, even though the blue and green circles didn't intersect each other. And you can see that here. You know, the green circle intersects the red circle twice. The blue circle intersects the red circle twice. The green and blue circles don't intersect. And I should have said in green and blue, we actually have circles because this patch is identified with that patch to form a circle. And this patch is identified with that patch to form a circle. So in red, we had linear gradients at all angles. And then in blue and green, we added in these quadratic patches in the vertical and horizontal directions. Where this Klein bottle is coming from is the next most common group of patches includes quadratic gradients at all angles, not just vertical or horizontal, but also these quadratic gradients you know, at, at diagonal angles. And then once you include all these patches, we indeed get this Klein bottle. You can see I have a, a square of patches where the top edge is identified with the bottom, but the right edge is identified with the left with a twist. So this is identified here, this is identified there, this is identified there, this is identified there, and so on. Okay, so that was how we formed the Klein bottle. You take a square, glue the top and bottom to get a cylinder and then glue the right and left with a twist to get the Klein bottle. I'll stop there. I went pretty fast, but it's, it's a beautiful high level overview of this data set that starts with real world images, three by three pixel patches from those images and identifies this reasonable model for the space, which for the most common patches is a circle. Then for the next co most common patches is three circles. And then for the next most common patches is an entire Klein bottle, which sounds a little bit made up, but in high dimensional data sets, you certainly can have interesting, beautiful shapes like the Klein bottle that appear inside of them. Public questions. All right, thanks so much.